Well, good morning. Isn't that a great video? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about taking up your cross today. We're going to talk about what it means to follow Jesus. And, but you don't have to do this alone. Um, uh, not just that Christ is with you, but the fact that there are other people. And so thank you. There were people that I called this week to help some of our widows, to help some of our single moms, some of our single ladies. Uh, and said, hey, can you give them a hand? They need this or that. And so many of you were great. You just stepped right up. And I actually had a guy who came this morning and said, hey, you could have called me. I'm like, well, I, your number was on speed dial. You were next if they didn't get what they needed. But um, anyway, so I just appreciate all that. And if you're still in need of help, if you'll let us know, um, uh, I'll tell you no. No, I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll be glad to help you in any way we can. Um, there are two funeral services today. Millie, who comes on Saturday night, some of you know her, sat back there on Saturday nights. Uh, her funeral is going to be over at Lost Lakes at noon today. And I know there's a meeting for the fall festival at noon, so that's, uh, but I wanted to let you know about it. And then John Black's uh, service today is at 3. Trudy and John, many of you know them. And so I wanted to let you know that. So uh, I do thank Rodney for going to the uh, uh, honor flight last night for World War II veterans, middle of the night, and saw those guys off. And I don't know if you know anything about Honor Flight. They fly them to D.C. to see the World War II memorial, and they fly them back. I mean, it's one day. They go up, they come back. They're back that night. So uh, just an amazing thing. So thank you for helping with all that, and we're very blessed. So, so here's the question. We're going to look at chapter 9 of Luke today. And I, once again, I just want to encourage you, read the chapter. I, I don't... I don't get to go through every verse. Every verse is awesome, but I don't get to go through every verse on Sunday morning, so I hope to give you a taste of Scripture and you get hungry for it and want a little more, so you'll take some time to read it. So this is my wife's walking stick, and you can guess where it's from. And uh, uh, if you don't know this, national parks have learned to cut up old closet rods and sell them to you. So you have a thing. But when, uh, uh, when the kids were little, I used to go to a place called the Round House. We called it the Round House because it's on Round Mountain, and the house on the edge of Round Mountain is round. I know. I'm a genius. And um, anyway, so we would go to Round Mountain, and from the, from the top of the mountain, you can actually see, I'm pretty sure it's Lake Toxaway. It's basically a river, but it's lake size. And uh, uh, from the top of that mountain, you can see the lake, and there's a trail that we would take. And you take the trail, first you go sideways, and then you end up on, I believe, what's called Daniel Boone's Trail. And then you could actually go down to, uh, I'm not sure if it's part of the Appalachian Trail or just a, a side thing, but it had the little white marks and the Boy Scouts maintained it. But you would get to the main trail and there would be steps that the Boy Scouts had put in. And I'm not meaning steps, I mean steps. And so you'd start walking the steps and you would get halfway and they had placed a bench that overlooked the lake halfway. And so I remember every time, you know, we had a backpack with us, we'd have some snacks, we'd sit down, get a drink, everybody would rest because you were exhausted already halfway down that mountain. And then you had a decision to make. Are we going to keep going down to the lake, down to the river? There, was, there were the rapids down there over rocks. There were waterfalls down there. There were two swinging bridges. I mean, just... Amazing. Are we going to continue or go back? Because at some point, we've got to go back. And of course, most of the time, I think 99% of the time, the kids are like, yeah, let's go, you know, and I'm like, uh. And uh, so it's one of those where there's so many steps that you do right leg, right leg, right leg, and then your right knee bothers you, so then you do left leg, left leg. If you haven't gotten to that age yet, you will. So anyway, so, so you go all the way down, you get down there, and you're tootling around and you're, you know, there's picnic tables down there. It's just an amazing place. And you actually get to the point where you're thinking, you know, we could just stay here. But then you look at the trees and you see the marks of the bears that have clawed <laughs> the trees. And the fact that the campground there has a place where you hang up your food so that the bears will eat your food and not eat you. And so you're like, mm, we're going to back. And so uh, you start going up, and once again, you get halfway up, and you're thinking, I don't know if I can make this. Sometimes it was muddy. Sometimes it would be raining on the way. You know, it seemed like it, the rain would come in when you were halfway down. And so you go back up, and you go up the mountain, and then you even have this little trail. And it was amazing how on the way down you didn't notice 
You noticed the steps, but you didn't notice that the trail was a little steep. But on the way back, now you're clawing with your hands and you're barely making it up. And you get back to the house. And I'll never forget getting back to the house. And you get that cup of fresh water and you put ice in it. And those of you who've lost power, you can borrow some ice before you go home if you need to. But um, put ice in it and just sit and look over the lake. And there was just this joy that would sweep over you. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, you did an amazing hike. Number two, you were done. Something about being done is like, oh. And then for days after that, you're like, I think my legs don't work anymore, right? Now, here's what I want to tell you. The truth for all of us is, all of us are on a journey. And when Jesus says to deny yourself and take up his cross and follow him, what that means is that you put aside your own selfishness, your own self-centeredness, your own way. You surrender your life to him. And so today as we talk about what does it cost to follow Jesus, it's not a... It's free. I know that John 3.16, you know, it's this whole idea of the free gift of God but the truth from Romans, but the, the truth is, not only is it a free gift, it's a really expensive gift that was given to us. And so what does it mean to follow Christ? And I hope to give you some practical things, this whole idea of surrender. So today we're going to talk about sacrificing, taking up our cross daily, and being humble. But I want you to know this too, on the journey, the amazing thing is, no matter how hard it is, and some of you are going through really hard times right now, always. There's just things that happen. Somebody called me this week. They've had the roughest year. As they're talking, I'm just like, I'm so sorry. I... But here's what I know. He's with you. And there's other people who can walk with you. And even in the middle of some of the toughest days, he can give you joy and peace. Not joy, not church lady joy. Hi. Not the crazy, whatever medicine they have you want. There's my grandchild answering back there. So today as we talk about these things, I want you to know you don't do this alone. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to do it. God's with you as you do it. And there's other people on this journey that will encourage you along the way. Some who've been through the same thing you've been through. Some people who, well, it seems like you're on the way down, they're on the way back up. And you're like, you can make it. And I'm glad I'm not going through what you're going through, all right? Here we go. Number one, sacrificing what I have to him. So Luke chapter 9 starts with Jesus sending out the disciples, and then we pick up this story, which many of you have heard. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, I love this, send the crowd away. They're starting to tell Jesus what to do. That, by the way, when you tell Jesus what to do, never goes the way you think it's going to go. So they try to tell Jesus what to do. Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countrysides, and then they try to be nice, and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. And I love what Jesus does. By the way, Jesus does not say what he's about to say to be literal. He says it to challenge them. So Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. To which the disciples all went, what? They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Now we find out from another passage that they actually got that from a kid in the crowd. Can I tell you a secret? I think there were other people that had fish and bread and when the disciples came around, they went, right? We only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for this whole crowd. By the way, we know from John chapter 6 that that was Philip. Philip was suddenly the budget guy. So Philip's like, Hi, we don't have money for this. Do you know that person? You, some of you are married to that person, right? All right, so... About 5,000 men were there. By the way, they counted the men. They didn't count the women. They didn't count the children. So it could have been 15,000. could have been 20,000. could have been 8,000. We don't know. We don't know. We, we, we don't know. People have written seminary papers on this because they have nothing better to do, I guess. But there's a lot of people. 
But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. All of the finance people love this. This is like a spreadsheet. They're like, groups of 50, that's a good start. Are we going to charge them all? How's it, what's going to happen? Are we taking a bucket collection? Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking to heaven, he gave thanks. Time out. I got to tell you a Greek word here that's really cool. This word for thanks is also the word for blessing. In some of your translations, it may say blessing. Other words, it says thanks. Both those are great. Here's what the word is, and you may have heard it before. It's where we get the word eulogy. And the word eulogy is what we use about a funeral. And what is it? It's talking kind or blessing someone who went before us. And let me tell you something I remember 40 years ago, Peter Lord saying. Don't wait for someone to die to bless them. Tell them now. Because they can't hear you at the funeral, so tell them now. So funny. But that's the truth. So Jesus takes the food. By the way, you ever wonder why we pray for dinner? He, that's what he did. But on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus, is die, Jesus dies, the guys don't recognize him until he blesses dinner. And then they're like, oh, that's Jesus, which is awesome. It, it was a normal thing for him, and now it's a normal thing, hopefully for you and for me, no matter where you're at, to take just a moment and pray over your meal to give thanks, to bless and thank God for what he's given. And it says, and he broke it. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate, and here's the real miracle for many of us, and we're satisfied. My sweet wife, if she eats dinner, she will say, I am full. And then she'll look at me and say, are you full? No. <laughs> Everything I eat is like you going to eat Chinese food, right? You eat Chinese food, you're full. What, an hour later, starving to death. My every food I eat is that way. Every, every food, right? And so this, to me, the miracle is not the amount of food. To me, it's the fact that all the people went, wow, that was good. I've had plenty. How about you? Yeah, plenty. They were all satisfied. And then it continues. By the way, this is the only time it ever happened in a church service. They all were satisfied, right? All right. Sorry. That was mean. All right, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Time out, time out. This is one of those questions when I get to heaven that I'm going to say, what happened to those? Did the disciples take them home? Did they feed the pigs? Did they did it disappear? Were they walking with them and all of a sudden, poof, oh. Or did they take them to, I don't know, I don't know. I don't, and it doesn't matter, but it's just a cool, weird thing to think about. All right. So, so let me give you what so many commentaries, and this is so true. This whole story right here is teaching us this. Nothing is impossible when you obey God. God, what do you want me to do? And then we do what he's called us to do. And the truth is he multiplies even what you do. To make it more effective than it would be. Sometimes on Sunday mornings on the way here, I'll pray, Lord, you know how distracted I am. Would you somehow translate what I'm about to say so that people can hear you and not me? Would you help them to forget all the dumb things I'll say today and only remember the part that you want them to remember? And that's what God can do. You ever feel like you're not the best parent? Maybe start praying, God, would you help me to be a better parent? God, would you help me to be a better grandparent? Lord, would you help me to be a better neighbor, a better friend? Lord, I know if I'm obedient to you that you'll take what I am and you can multiply it. And that's what he does. When we're obedient to him. So just be obedient to him. I love what Francis Chan says here. God does not call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we will be in trouble if he doesn't come through. Somebody said, well, I know I need Jesus during the hard times. And I say, I know I need Jesus if I drive. 
anywhere, especially on I-95, right? We, we need him all the time and all that we do. And so sometimes we just have to recognize it and say, God, I really need you. I need you to walk with me. And I'm willing to sacrifice what you've given me. What? In order to do what you've called me to do. So what does God want you to sacrifice today? What are your two fish? What, or five fish. And what are your two loaves? What, what is the thing that God has called you to say, God, this is yours. Use it any way. Use me any way you want. Number two. Taking up my cross daily. So you saw me talk to the kids about a backpack. We have a lady in our church who started hiking the Appalachian Trail. And I love it because she'll post what she's packing. And it's not much. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, where's the TV remote, right? I mean, what, right? But what? You only pack what you need. And you better pack it just right. Because if you don't know have what you need, first of all, you're going to be in trouble. And if you have too much stuff, guess what? You're also going to be in trouble. And so many of us, even though God's called us to take up our cross, we also take up all kind of stuff because we don't deny ourselves. We say, God, I want whatever I want and take up my cross. And he's like, you're going to get really tired if you take up all that unforgiveness. You're going to get really tired if you don't lay down the things that are holding you back. I better put my backpack in. I know. It's about 1,000 pounds. Pastorally speaking, it's 1,000 pounds. Let's read the passage here. By the way, uh, right before this, Peter calls uh, Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 21 to 26. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Talking about him being Christ. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And so Jesus is going back to Old Testament prophecy and telling the disciples, this is what's going to happen. As usual, then he said to all of them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, listen, must deny themselves Take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. So in the time of Jesus, in the time immediately following the life of Christ after his death and resurrection, one of the things that happened in the early church was there were people who were worshiping other gods. There were people who sacrificed food to, to, to other statues and other things. And one of the things they had to lay down is their desire to try to have these other religions and carry it in with Christianity. What is it that God's calling you to lay down? And what's the cross he's calling you to take up? See, when we talk about the cross, what's that talking about? Self-sacrifice. Did you know if you help anyone that no good deed goes unpunished? So you will help somebody, and what will happen? They won't appreciate it. That's your cross. I'll never forget, I went to a camp years ago, and there was a speaker. One of my favorite speakers was a guy named Dave Busby. Don't know if you've ever even heard of him. You can Google him online. Powerful. Awesome. And here's one of the reasons why. When he was a kid, he got polio. And he missed that vaccination time. He was in that, that generation that kind of missed that. And, and so he got polio. So he had these little bitty legs. But he worked out all the time. So he had this huge upper body. But he also couldn't catch his breath sometimes. And so as a youth, you're watching him and he'd be talking and he'd go. <gasps> That'll keep your attention. Is he going to fall over right in front? But I never forget after a talk one day, I was a youth leader at this time and I was sitting near the front row and Dave Busby was speaking. And my students, for the first time, I got to take a group of students and they got to hear Dave Busby. And I was so excited that they got to hear him. And I'll never forget this little junior high kid came up to Dave Busby at this huge conference. And I heard him talking to Dave Busby and he said to Dave Busby, hey, these kids are making fun of me at school and this is happening and that's happening. And Dave Busby looks at the kid right in the eyes and goes, welcome to the cross. 
didn't tell him, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Dave was not the most compassionate person with kids. But he liked to tell them the truth. It's like, welcome to the cross. And the truth for all of us is when you're obedient to God, when you serve on a team, if you help at the fall festival, if you help with the soundboard, if you do something at church, if you go out of your way to help a neighbor and you pick up something, can I tell you that many, many, many times they will not appreciate it. But not only does no good deed go unpunished, I know that no good deed goes unnoticed by God. And so when you literally pick up the cross, you don't get any accolades, you don't get any appreciation, you don't get it, but you know you're doing what God wants you to do. He notices. The enemy always wants to discourage you. He wants you to quit. He doesn't want you to help. He wants you to be introverted. He doesn't want you to have friends. He wants you to stay away from people. He's going to let you get hurt by Christians. He'll send a Christian who's barely a Christian to attack you just to teach you that you don't need to be around Christians. How dare you join a small group? Those people are just jerks. Why does he do all that? Because the most important thing you can do is take up your cross and do what God's called you to do even when it's hard. Because one day the reward is so much better than the hurt you're dealing with. And you've probably heard me say it, but I'm going to say it again. I always do the martyr conversation when I get to feeling sorry for myself. Everybody feels sorry for themselves sometimes. And I always imagine myself in heaven and the, one of the martyrs saying to me, so what struggle did you go through? Oh man, I was a pastor. You should have seen some of the notes and letters I got. There was some lady quit the church because I didn't say hi to her one Sunday. It was unbelievable. By the way, that has happened. Hi, 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 hi. Okay, just making sure. Save that one up for next week, Tracy. All right, so, so right? So I'm talking to him and I'm like, yeah, it was so hard. It really hurt my feelings. And I say to him, so what happened to you? Oh, well, we were during the Roman times and they fed my family to lions while I watched and then fed me to a lion. Uh -huh. <laughs> I had a great life. The funny thing is, our perspective so often on suffering has to do with our selfishness and self-centeredness. That's why the first part of that is deny yourself. Which means I'm not so worried if anybody notices. I'm not so worried if anybody appreciates this. I'm not so worried if I'm just going to do what God called me to do, even though some days it feels like a climb. And by the way, by the way, some of the times that God's blessed me the most are the times that I didn't want to help. And he has a way to do that just to mess with you. Deny yourself, serve others. When it's not convenient, when it's not appreciated, remember that you're not doing it for them. By the way, sometimes, sometimes, you ready for this? Taking up your cross means saying no to something that you want to say yes to because you want that person to like you. And you still say no. For the codependence, that's the hardest part, by the way. That one's, you assertive people are like, that's not a problem. Yeah, the codependents in here are like, no, I get it. Number three. Humbling my heart in his presence. Now, I know it's hard to believe because Ricky has a child now, but when he was little, he, we'd go to the pool and we'd go to the YMCA and we'd be at the pool and I'd say, Ricky, jump. And man, he'd just take off the wall, come right at me, come right at me, come right at me. And we'd play for a little while and then Ricky'd go back and go get a drink and I'd be talking to his brother. Hey man, you having a good time? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, something hit me in the head and it was him. He just, he trusted me so much, he just flew off the side and headbutted me. I still have mental issues because of that, but listen, I explain so much. When you have the faith of a child, sometimes that means you jump knowing that God's going to catch you. So we skipped a story here about the transfiguration. It's a great story. And Peter, James, and John are on the mountain with Jesus. They're like, let us build tabernacles because Moses and Elijah are here and, you know, all this stuff. And it's funny because God shows up and goes, uh, listen to my son, which is pretty much like, what, are you guys, listen to him, you know. And so that's what happens right before this. 
And then Jesus says this, Luke chapter 9, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man, he's telling them again, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. I love this. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among the disciples. To which of them would be the greatest? Jesus just said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. He just told them, I'm going to the cross. And they're like, I'm better than you are. Jesus had to be like, oh, yeah, right? Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me for It is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. See, as we go through life, it's easy to get focused on our own problems and our own pain. It is easy to. Because it's painful. Sometimes life's painful and it's hard and people are mean and there's a lot of jerks out there. Every once in a while somebody say, have I met you before? And I'm like, I might have run you off the road. I'm really sorry. And life's just hard sometimes, but here's the thing. One day, just like us getting to the round house and having the best water we've ever tasted, (laughs) one day this journey will be over. And if you're a Christian and you get to heaven, God has one question. Did you trust my son? Yes. Good answer. Because the sacrifice of Jesus, the fact that he died for you, when we surrender our lives to him, it says that he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. So one day, when we finally finish this journey, which is a pain, sometimes it's beautiful, but sometimes it's awful. But one day when we finish this journey and we find our way home, it is going to be more peace, more joy, more refreshing than any nest tea plunge you've ever had. And that's what waits at the end. When we take up our cross daily on this earth, one day we set it all down and we say it was for you. And we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to him, the fact that Jesus died and rose again to pay for your sins because we're all messed up and broken. Or if you're here today and you're a Christian, and as I talk today, God put his finger on a part of your life. Maybe it's that selfishness. Maybe it's that self-centeredness. Maybe it's something you need to do and be obedient. Whatever it is, just agree with God and do it. It's much easier that way. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for each one here. I pray that you would bless them. Lord, for those going through great difficulties... Maybe their family's going through great difficulties. Right now, Lord, would you give them your presence, your peace, your joy? Father, I pray too as we go along on this journey that, Lord, we could also be carriers of joy, carriers of peace to other people where those who we are around, we can bring your peace to them. We can encourage them on the journey. Lord, I do pray that we'd be obedient to what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.